Sejam de novo bem-vindos. Vamos retomar os nossos trabalhos com esta conferência final de encerramento. Eu vou saudar o nosso convidado, fazer depois em português uma breve apresentação dele e a seguir dar-lhe a palavra. Max Carri, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Welcome and thank you very much for your participation in this conference about planning and democracy. And it's a pleasure to have you here with, with us. I will do your uh, very short presentation, introduction for, for the, the people that is here. I will do that in Portuguese, and uh, after that I will uh, give you the floor. Um, então, queria só brevissimamente dizer-vos quem é Max Caillé, para quem não o conheça. Ele, na verdade, é um cientista político, o um economista político cuja investigação uh, se tem uma perspectiva histórica. Um, é atualmente, pertence atualmente ao New Institute de Hamburgo um, e tem aí trabalhado como diretor de investigação, um, sendo também parte de um think tank alemão sobre macrofinança. Um, ele estudou em Oxford, na LSE, na London School of Economics, em Yale, o que é verdadeiramente um conjunto notável de, de escolas, e tem o, recentemente trabalhado sobre teoria política, como já disse, economia política, e sobretudo tem trabalhos, aqueles que eu conheço, de grande interesse sobre as relações entre capitalismo e democracia no estudo sobre a modernidade ocidental. Uh, colabora em várias, ou tem artigos, artigos publicados em várias revistas científicas, mas também em jornais de maior divulgação, como o Financial Times, o Guardian, uh, e também da imprensa alemã, evidentemente. Uh, para além destes temas, outro dos seus interesses é uh, o tema da conferência de hoje, sobre alterações climáticas e planeamento, e essa é, evidentemente, também uma das razões mais próximas, porque... O convidamos. So the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, and I give you the the floor. Fantastic. Thank you very much for for the kind introduction and for the invitation. It's the first time I'm I'm in Portugal, even if only virtually. So I'm I'm very much looking forward to this. I'm going to share my slides now. So I will speak about uh, climate change and planning. And I will try to make three points about those two things. And we'll see if I can make them in 40 minutes. It might be that the last one um, will we'll get a shorter treatment and then we can come back to it in, in the discussion. So I want to argue that um, planning is essential in order for us to, to master the challenge of, of climate change, to decarbonize um, quickly enough. I want to argue that um, even though it's technically difficult, it looks possible. Um, to, to do planning for the purpose of decarbonization. And then I want to say something more about what precisely makes planning difficult, what the, the most important difficulties are, because identifying those clearly um, will help us to, to master them and to deal with them. And um, before we get into those three points, essential, possible, and difficult, I just wanted to say briefly, you know, what are the stakes here? Why, why is it so important? And I think nobody in the room needs a lot of reminding, but sometimes it's good to, to have the, the, the pictures there again. The, the chart on the left is um, a set of scenarios from the 2018 special report by the IPCC about scenarios, um, emission pathways that would still enable a one and a half degree world. And then on the right, you have a chart from, from a great paper uh, that was published in Nature uh, on, on um, committed emissions from existing um, infrastructure investments. And so what the paper on the right did is they looked at all the existing uh, infrastructural investments, power plants, transmission lines, factories, that sort of stuff. And they said, well, if we run those, uh, those existing plants according to their normal economically uh, usual lifetime, how much would they emit? And then when you, when you compare this figure with the, the emissions budget that we have left in the one and a half degree scenarios, you see that basically 
our emissions budget is already exhausted. So if we only run the things that we've already built, if we run those things all the way to, to their usual end of economic life, we will have exhausted the, the, the entire carbon budget that we have left for, for one and a half degrees. So this means that we either have to immediately stop building new things, um, that's very likely not going to happen and would be problematic for, for the purpose of green transition um, anyway, if we, if we don't immediately stop building new things, then uh, it means that we have to switch off, we have to turn off existing um, fossil fuel-based infrastructure before the end of their, their planned economic lifetimes. That will have financial consequences because often they're debt financed and then you can't pay the debt back because you switched off the, the power plant. So that creates financial problems. Or we have to have really big... Um, uh, negative carbon um, emission technologies that take uh, CO2 out of the air and they're, they are unproven and expensive and difficult. So I think just putting those numbers out there, those charts, shows you know, how urgent the question of, of transitioning um, to a green economy of, of decarbonization is. And the, the question of speed and the, the uncertainty that speed creates is very central to the rest of my talk. So I wanted to and throw these charts out there to begin. Okay, now on to, to the main presentation. Um, three points, why is planning essential, why is it possible, and what makes it very, very difficult. The first one, you know, why is it essential? Um, I think everyone here in the room is at a point where we say, look, the, the time for debating whether or not we decarbonize that time is well over. It's all about how do we decarbonize now, right? So, so that's really the question in the room. Nobody's debating whether it's all about how. And once you start taking that question seriously, um, you realize that the, the, the how of decarbonization is fiendishly, fiendishly difficult. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a political economist. I often work um, with a very macro lens, but I, I hear that a lot of um, the people in the room are, are um, people from urban planning or from, from the state administration. So you will know how tricky the actual implementation of decarbonization is, you know, when, when the rubber hits the road. And just to, to kind of mention a few examples, this is a picture of a, a Ford factory in my hometown in Cologne in Germany. Uh, this is a picture of the, the Tata steelworks in, in Wales. And this is a picture of a very modern gas power plant in, in uh, West County in, in Florida, close to Miami, Miami Beach. And when you look at those specific installations, you immediately ask yourself, well, none of those three could still be around at scale in a decarbonized world. But what does that mean today? You know, do we switch off the, the gas power plant in Florida? What are the consequences of that? Do we, de you know, how do we build windmills if we don't have the, the steel that comes from the steelworks in, in, uh, in, in Wales? And then, you know, speaking from my hometown, Ford has just announced that they're going to build electric vehicles in that factory. So suddenly it's very tempting to say, well, that's great. Let's keep it running. It's going to contribute to, to a decarbonized uh, mobility, but then of course you have questions about well, how sustainable is electromobility? What about the battery supply chain? So, a million and one questions just on the kind of energy and industrial side. And then you have further complications coming out of the the food chain. This is a picture of a a large uh, meat packing plant about two hours away from from a hometown in Cologne. Um, and again, anyone who looks at sustainability immediately realizes that the way that we consume food in in the global north, in in Europe and in the United States that level of meat consumption cannot scale to the global level. So how do we deal with, with that? Again, you have the, the kind of very specific questions. And then you have questions of land use that sit all the way upstream in the supply chain and where, where you have competition between uh, land use for, for growing food and land use for producing biofuels. And then, of course, both of these things compete with actually leaving land alone and, and creating space for wildlife and pre rewilding the earth which is important for biodiversity and for preventing pandemics like the one we've, we've all lived through. So you have lots of these competing things. And once you start saying, well, how do we actually decarbonize? You realize it's a massive, massive coordination problem. Somebody has to decide what happens with the Ford factory, what happens with the steel work, what happens with the, the, the gas factory, what happens with food, what happens with, with land. And so it's a massive, massive coordination problem. Fortunately for us, um, humans, we're pretty good at solving coordination problems. You know, the fact that I can sit here in Berlin right now and talk to you in, in Portugal is the result of a really sophisticated division of labor that produced this laptop and the, the screen and the, 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 the loudspeakers that, that are on your end, fantastic. So, you know, we know how to do coordination and maybe we can learn from how we do it in the past for how we coordinate better in the future. We have three basic options for how we coordinate a division of labor. This comes from, from the um, political economist Karl Polanyi. 
the first one is gift exchange. You know, we, we all just have Christmas, people bring gifts, and, and there's a rough idea of reciprocity, but it's not quantitatively precise. And if somebody um, has economic difficulties, maybe they lost their job, then we all take that into account, and maybe we, we give them a bigger gift this year and maybe expect smaller gifts back. And so it's this way in which we coordinate the division of labor, but it's not very precise. And so it's not something that we use to coordinate uh, a kind of a modern economy. This leads to other ones, markets, the kind of quantitatively precise exchange of goods and services for money and then money for goods and services. And then planning, where you again have quantitatively precise arrangements that are made according to a logic other than the logic of exchange. Instead, it's a logic of um, a, a body, it could be a single person, it could be a collection of people like a ministry or, or a parliament that comes up with a specific plan and that's then implemented in, in various ways. And I think we can rule out gift exchange as, as a coordination mechanism for, for the, the green transition to decarbonization because of this issue around precision. And it's great for kind of coordinating exchange in a family and in small and local and trusted groups, but let's park that. So markets and planning are, are still in the room. And I want to begin by saying that you know markets are fantastic for the coordination of a division of labor under certain circumstances. And you know this is this is not a joke. It's a daily reality. And one of the the examples that I think show this the clearest is the following. This is um, drawing on work from a from a British artist called Thomas Thwaite, and he thought, well, you know, how how can I show the importance of this market coordinated division of labor? And he did that through an art project where he said, I Thomas will build my own toaster. I'm not going to go out there and trade with people and buy and sell. I would just go and do it myself. And you see the result on the left. Um, it took him about a year. It was very expensive in terms of tools, which he did end up buying. So he spent about a thousand pounds on getting the tools. And then if you calculate the cost of his labor, just using minimum wage, that adds another 40,000 pounds roughly. So the toaster on the left is about a 41,000 pound toaster. And you can see it's not a great toaster. And then the toaster on the right is, is kind of a standard supermarket toaster. I looked it up online. It was, uh, I think, €9.99, Euros 99, so really tremendously efficient. And that toaster is largely produced through a market-coordinated division of labor where you know, somebody in a mine somewhere dug up some copper to make the electrics and somebody else produced some oil to make the plastics. And it was coordinated all the way from there to um, the supermarket or the Amazon delivery. And all of that for the resource equivalent of €10 Euros is truly fantastic. So I think it's reasonable to say that our first, you know, first hypothesis should be, let's use this mechanism, which gives us so much prosperity, let's use this coordination mechanism to coordinate the, the, the green transition decarbonization as well. But this is my first point. I think it's not going to be enough. I think it's extremely risky to use markets to rely mainly on markets to coordinate the green transition. And that's why I think planning is so essential. So why do I think that relying on markets to coordinate the green transition is so risky? Well, there are three risk factors. The first one is when you look at investment markets, they can, there's the risk that investment markets uh, tend an economy in the wrong direction. Why is that? So investment markets operate differently from, from regular markets, like markets for toasters or for chewing gum or for shoes. Because in investment markets, you're always bringing the future into the present. You know, in a way, if, if I buy uh, stock or bonds in a particular company, it's a bet that I'm taking on the future of that company. But given that I'm making this bet in the context of an investment market, my primary concern need not be the future of that company. It might be enough for me if all the other investors around me think, ah, this is a great investment. So if I have a feeling that tomorrow there's going to be a, a kind of a, a great bubble, a great kind of popular uh, surge of interest in, I don't know, uh, some obscure mid 20th century artist, I can buy, I can buy, you know, either the, the works of art or some kind of financial vehicle on that. And even though there's no, there's no kind of cash flow, there's no real product market behind it, I might get tremendously rich because other investors then uh, kind of come buy it later and, and then I, I make a huge profit. And uh, Don Maynard Keynes once described this as a beauty contest where 
the goal is to guess what all the other people in the audience, um, who they think is the most attractive person. So it's this second order dynamic where you're not thinking about, well, what's actually the best company? You're thinking about what does everyone else think is the best company? And this generates a dynamic where um, you can have self-fulfilling prophecies that are completely delinked from what actually goes on in these real markets and in the real economy. So I think the strongest example for this today is, is Bitcoin and the crypto ecosystem in general. They, there's, no, um, there's no kind of cash flow of, of um, real profits that, that, that Bitcoin uh, produces. The real use, the kind of currency use of Bitcoin is extremely limited. So really what people are speculating on is that other people buy it. Um, and, and that's completely disconnected from, from, from real, uh, real markets and real goods and services. And this creates an enormous risk. You know, it, it means that investment can flow in the direction of a bubble. And this bubble could be productive or could be unproductive. You know, a good example of a productive bubble are the, the railroad bubbles in the 19th century. Lots of people lost a lot of money on them, but they created a real infrastructure that get people from A to B extremely valuable in terms of uh, delivering the service of transport. But the Bitcoin bubble or the, the tulip bubble in, in the Netherlands in the 17th century, those are bubbles that just use up you know, real energy or real land, which you could use for other services and which today we have to use for other services because, as I said at the beginning, time is really limited. Um, and so we can't afford these kinds of bubbles. And so this dynamic of investment markets as opposed to first order markets is a, is a big problem in, in the coordination of the green transition. The second problem with relying on markets to coordinate the green transition is this problem of paralysis in the context of uncertainty. So this chart that I've just shown is a chart of how many new houses are being built in the US. And it starts in, in 1999 and runs to about 2021. And you can see um, in about 2006, the number of houses that are produced drops dramatically. It bottoms out in late 2009 and then increases slowly again. Now, the, 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 the drop in 2006, 2007, 2008 makes a lot of sense. Financial crisis, there's kind of financing is tight. OK, fine. But look at the period from 2010 onwards to 2018, you know, 10 years after financial crisis, housing construction is still massively below where it was in 2004, 2005. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that um, house builders started feeling massively more uncertain about whether they would be able to sell their houses and at which prices they would be able to sell their houses. So they have this uncertainty about whether the investment today is going to pay off tomorrow. And in the face of uncertainty, a lot of investors just choose not to put their money into risky real economy projects and instead they park it in government bonds or in other quote unquote safe assets. Um, and again, in the context of, of decarbonization, that's a huge problem because if, if um, this context of uncertainty, you know, some sectors are going to shrink, other sectors are going to, to rise, but nobody knows which ones and, and which technologies within the sector, if you have this general feeling of uncertainty, and it leads private investors not to invest, well, then the transition simply isn't going to happen. And so relying on these private investment markets is risky because they might get you in the wrong direction. And even if they get you in the right direction, they might move too slowly. And the third um, uh, problem that's very similar to the first one, but slightly different, is this uh, problem of small steps. If you look at the, the actual operation of, of, of um, markets and market investment, it's often a policy of small steps. It's often about iterative change, about squeezing out more efficiency, and it gets you the, the 10 euro toaster, but it doesn't get you, you know, the rocket to the moon or the iPhone. And there's the whole work of Maria, Mariana Mazzucato, who's shown that these really path-breaking innovations or, or kind of real changes in the division of labor, they're not usually uh, the result of, of profit-oriented decentralized market investment, but they're usually the result of, of either state-led um, not profit-oriented investment or, or planning, or they can be the result of kind of crazy individuals who do things not for profit. But, but this is another element that, that kind of questions whether we should rely on, on markets to coordinate the, the green transition. Um, now, just because markets are bad doesn't mean that planning is good, right? They could both be problematic for, for the green transition. Um, so it's worth briefly thinking about how do markets actually help? Well, um, Coming back to, to this kind of market question, there's a, a particular risk of using markets in the green transition, and that's you're your, your kind of faced with um, choosing between either, if you want to coordinate it through markets, what do you do? You use a carbon tax, right? That's, that's kind of the standard 
market coordination for, for, for decarbonization, what all economists say, well, how do you do it? You put a carbon tax on things or you do emissions trading, and then that feeds into the price of goods and services and the bad thing with lots of emissions gets phased out and the good things, they get up together. Well, given the three problems I just spoke about, the risk is that when you do this carbon pricing, you're faced with two bad options. One is you do carbon pricing aggressively with the kind of carbon price that might move the transition quickly, but then you might break the actual functioning of the markets. And I don't know how many of you follow, follow you know, financial market press news, but um, during COVID, there was a moment when the London Metal Exchange, that's on the picture there, and um, where you trade lots of uh, raw materials and in particular the, the metal nickel. The, the London Metal Exchange, the market for, for nickel literally broke when the price movements were, were too big because of some combination of short sellers and margin calls and, and kind of a bit of financial arithmetic. But the bottom line is that if, you, if, if prices move too aggressively, market functioning breaks. So then you might say, well, okay, let's, let's still use market coordination, but let's do carbon pricing in a way that preserves the functioning of this mechanism. But then you have the risk that the, the transition is too slow. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the kind of twin problem that you have to steer your way through if you want to use market coordination. Um, I believe that planning can minimize the risk of transition failure that would come from, from relying too much on markets. And it can do that because it can take uncertainty out of two important processes. One is the scale up. You know, if you have a plan that says we will scale up renewables at this rate and we will have you know, this production from, from the renewable electricity system, then consumers of electricity can plan with a certain volume. And perhaps even more importantly, you can reliably make plans for scaling down things. So if you commit to phasing out, as Germany has done, phasing out coal production, then the, the owners of coal mines and the people working at coal mines, they can start making life plans around, well, I will no longer be a coal miner after 2030 or after 2028 or something like that. And so the uncertainty of what scenario do I plan for is, is taken out of the, the scale-up, although that's a bit hard because, you know, you might plan for a scale-up that then doesn't happen for some reason. The world is complicated. And you can take uncertainty down, uh, out of, out of scale-downs. I mean, I think if you do these two things, you remove a lot of the uncertainty that really troubles markets. And if you do that, then the market, the remaining markets, they will actually function better. I think it's important to, to kind of side notes, one is to say planning doesn't eliminate uncertainty. It usually shifts it from one place to another. So um, usually when you use it in the context of public investment, it shifts uncertainty from the outcome to costs. You know, the city of Berlin planned to build a new airport. The airport has been built, I think, at a cost four times the originally planned cost. It's great for people who want to travel because the airport is there. The public budget has to absorb the uncertainty. And, and so that raises a question of, which part of the division of labor, which institution in society is best placed to carry the uncertainty. And, and in this context, I think the, 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 the state, the public balance sheet is a, is a good um, place to put the uncertainty. And classic example of this is the French nuclear build out where, where they really planned at scale um, to transition their energy system from fossil fuel to, to uh, well, the electricity system, um, not all of energy, but electricity to nuclear. Um, and, and they did that, and it, yeah, they had cost overruns, but they achieved it in the yeah. end. And the second side note is to say I will not be talking a lot about innovation. Um, I think planning decarbonization can work with existing technologies. So the third point that I mentioned earlier about Mariana Mazzucato's work, that's kind of parked and, and um, not, not the focus of, of what I talk. I also think it's um, important to be precise about planning. As I said at the beginning, I'm a, I'm a political economist, and, and I come at things with a macro lens. So... When, when I hear the word planning and the people that I talk to, the conferences that I go to, often people think you're talking about a command economy. And I think it's very important to be clear that planning is different from a command economy. In particular, um, planning is about the formulation of plans, um, how you implement these plans, how you then push them into the real division of labor in, in society. That's a separate question. It's obviously connected. But it's a separate question, and there are many tools for, for pushing plans into uh, the real economy. It could be public investment, it could be financial regulation, it could be you know bans and mandates, so direct product regulation, process regulation. It could be subsidies, it could be taxes. There are many different ways in which you can uh, take a, a high-level plan and push it into the economy. Of course, 
thinking of, you know, you've got your plan and then thinking of which tools you're going to use is part of the process of planning. But nobody says that the only instrument you can use is a command economy where you say, you go and do this and, and, and there's kind of no, um, no space left for, for, for initiative. So I think that's, that's very important. And the other important thing is to say, I think is to say that um, planning requires strategic goals. You know, you have to plan for something. And again, it doesn't mean that there can only be one goal. Um, if you look at history, there are very different examples of, of successful planning. You know, one is the conversion of the American economy from a peacetime economy to a wartime economy in the late 30s, early 40s, same in the UK, actually. And then the second one is the reconstruction of basic industries in France after World War II, which I will talk about um, in the next uh, block. And the third one, hopefully, will be decarbonization. I think, arguably, there already is a fair amount of planning um, that's taking place around decarbonization. Okay, so um, that was the first block, why I think planning is essential. It basically comes from the, the, the riskiness and potential failure of markets that just don't deal very well with uncertainty, especially when it comes to these big infrastructural investments and when you don't have time for trial and error and feedback loops. In a situation like that, um, I think it's essential to use planning to shift the uncertainty from outcome uncertainty. We can't afford that. We don't have the time. We have to decarbonize. So you want to shift it from outcome uncertainty to maybe cost uncertainty on the public balance sheet, or maybe there are other ways in which you can shift it. But I think getting the uncertainty away from outcomes is just hugely important, and that means doing it through, through planning. Now, um, I don't know how many of you in, in the room um, are, are kind of political economists or, or who are familiar with the history of thought around planning. Um, but in the 1920s and 1930s, there was this big debate called the socialist planning debate, socialist calculation debate. Probably many of you know it. Um, and of course, the, the big question of this debate was whether planning an economy was possible, technically possible. And I think it's very dangerous to go into the socialist calculation debate because, you know, some people go in there when they're doing their PhD age 20 and they come out age 40, 20, you know, working on the project for 20 years. And they look like they're 80 because it's such a difficult debate and so much has been written on it. So I, I don't want to go into the socialist calculation debate, but I think it is worth thinking about how do we know that planning is technically um, possible um, at the, this kind of macroeconomic political economy view? And, you know, at first glance, it's, it's, it, there's a pretty strong case to be made that um, coordinating the transition through planning is hard, really, really hard. Um, this this um, picture there is a, a um, screenshot from the sustainability accounting system of a French company. I'm a luxury group called Caring. They own the brands of Gucci, Balenciaga, like a bunch of luxury brands, doesn't really matter. And they decided, because they thought it's good for their marketing, to, to kind of really understand their own sustainability footprint and then kind of plan um, a, a kind of more sustainable production process. And you see here, they have six dimensions of sustainability, um, everything from greenhouse gases to water consumption, water pollution, all of that. And they have five stages of their supply chains. Do you immediately see, okay, this is a bit of a complicated thing, even just one company. Then you think, well, what do we actually mean by sustainability at the macro level? You have the sustainable development goals with 17 different goals, 169 indicators. You have the planetary boundaries, social foundations, planetary boundaries framework. Um, you know, how do you translate that into actual planning for an entire economy, whether it's Portugal or Germany or the European Union, it just looks like a technically very, very, very demanding task. Um, and so in addition to the technical difficulty, there's also a second thing that I think is very important to bear in mind. Um, planning can often go wrong. Um, there's a history of ambitious state projects that fail. And uh, this book, Seeing Like a State by, by James Scott, is a wonderful summary of, of many of, of you know, the projects that have been uh, planned and that are attempts by, by a state to impose a certain plan, a certain vision on, on society, on the division of labor, on the environment, where the outcomes were massively unintended in, in the end. And I think it's important to, to bear that in mind. So um, this is not easy. Why do we think or why do we have reason to think that it's still possible? Well, there are good historical examples. And I'm going to go through one example, and I think that shows ways in which planning the transition at this big level is possible. And then I'll look at the time and see if we can still talk about the politics of it. But let's talk about the example that I think suggests that planning something like decarbonization is, is possible. Um, 
And this example is the Monet plan that uh, was, was first drawn up and then implemented in France in the late 1940s. This was a plan to um, reconstruct the industrial base of France. And the reason why, why um, France decided to, to go for a planning approach then, it's, it's, it's a combination of different factors having to do with the strength of the Communist Party at the time and, and the geopolitical context. But one of the reasons was the sheer amount of uncertainty um, that that uh, French government faced in, in, in the immediate aftermath of World War II. I think it's very easy to forget how unstable a moment 1945, 46, 47 were, at least if you're from, from a country like Germany, which after 1950 had this tremendous growth miracle like France as well. And so in Germany, people often think World War II is over and then this economic miracle begins and there was nothing in between. But actually, the years 45, 46, 47, extremely unstable and, and uh, borderline famine, and, and no one knows what the future of Europe is. After all, after the last Great War, things didn't work out so well. So this moment, when you put yourself back into the moment of 1945, 46, it's extremely uncertain. And so they decided, well, how do we reduce this uncertainty by coming up with a plan that guides this, this process of industrial reconstruction. There are a couple of things that we can learn from, from, from this. So there, there's a picture of, uh, of Jean Monnet and then, then um, a chart of the uh, electricity production that comes from a trade union brochure from, I think, 1950 in the end that kind of shows uh, how successful the plan was, even though it, you know, the targets weren't fully achieved, but it was generally well received. And um, what I think is is useful for us today about this historical example is that it navigated a context of uncertainty and it faced a double constraint. The, the double constraint um, for the, the Monet plan was um, they had to calculate in both France and US dollars because they weren't exchangeable at the time. And so anything having to do with US dollars, especially paying for imports, had to be calculated and planned for separately from France. And if you just think about it conceptually or mathematically, we have a very similar problem today because we have to think about both you know, the planetary boundaries, the environmental limits. We basically have this carbon constraint. That's a budget constraint that runs on the environmental side. And then we have to think about you know, we need prosperity in order to get a majority to do this thing. You know, the politics won't work unless we, we also uh, achieve the social foundations in this donut framework or unless we achieve a, a kind of a level of prosperity that's acceptable. So you have these two things planetary boundaries and prosperity, and you need to figure out how to kind of square both of them. And the Monet plan had a similar, structurally a similar problem with, with the, the two different non-convertible currencies. Um, what can we learn from it? I think there are two features that are useful to, to take away from it today. One is how they approached the planning problem, and that was with a sectoral focus, and then how they used organizational structures and how they brought the right people together to talk to each other. And I think both of those are features that we can use today. The sectoral focus, the Monet plan was not a comprehensive plan for the entire French economy. It was a plan to reconstruct the industrial base, but it only focused, quote unquote only, on six sectors, coal mining, electricity, steel, cement, uh, agricultural machinery, but in practice that meant tractors, and transport, and that meant railroads, roads, and rivers and canals and that kind of stuff. And um, if you look at the, the numbers, the, the investment volumes in those six target sectors, um, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor. It's the third uh, column from the right, the total, and the number is 536, so about 500 um, billion francs were in those planned sectors uh, out of a total volume of about 2,300 um, billion francs. So about a quarter of the total investment volume was part of those planned sectors. And I think this is something that we should take away for, for thinking about planning and decarbonization today. It's not possible to plan an entire economy. It's the, the, the level of complexity is too high, but it is possible to take key sectors and think about the, the trajectories, the, the, the pathways along which they, they should develop. And so today you might think, well, planning could focus on the energy sector, again on transport, and then housing, agriculture, and industry. And if we fix those, if we decarbonize those, and if we set up agriculture in, in the right way, then we can probably deal with climate change and with biodiversity and land use and, and get the bulk of the problem done. And so the takeaway here is don't plan the whole economy, plan for the particular mission that, that, uh, that you need to solve. And that's, uh, I think, a very important first lesson from, from the money plan. 
The second um, thing I think we can take away from the Monet plan is how it um, brought people together. Um, it, it reduced uncertainty through, you know, not just writing down numbers and charts and words on a piece of paper, but through connecting people who were making decisions, getting them to talk to each other, and then through this process, having their consent, their buy-in for the thing that ends up on paper. So the process of planning, I would argue, was just as important as the actual plan that, that came out of it. If you don't have the right process, then the plans that you produce are not going to be feasible and um, they won't have the support of the people who would actually need to implement it. And so the question is, how, how was this achieved? In the case of the Monet plan, it was achieved through setting up these modernization commissions. And here again, there are two factors, two, two features that are interesting and important. One is that um, there were many modernization commissions and that allowed them to be specialized. So again, I don't know if you can read this, but um, this, is, this is a kind of archival picture from, from uh, the, the original uh, organigram. And you can see that uh, there's the Uyeris, the, the, the coal mines, electricity production, um, there's the steel steel uh, commission there. And so, again, breaking it down uh, in the right way made the problem tractable. It, it allowed you to simplify the complexity to a level where people could actually grapple with it. Um, the other feature, other than this kind of sectoral structure, is who was in there. And you had a combination of civil servants from, from government, trade union representatives, and people from business and people from finance. And getting all of those parties around the table meant you had the relevant players there and they could talk to each other and say, this is not feasible or this is something we could do. And through doing this, they would commit to um, then, you know, if you've said this is feasible, walking that back a year later becomes harder. So through this process of planning, um, you, you already generate a, a bit of momentum for, for implementation. Um, so wrapping up this, this second part, um, you know, I, I showed some reasons why I think planning is technically very difficult. Um, but I think it's it's politically uh, sorry it's it's technically possible, and because we have these historical examples, and because we can learn from them, and in particular I think we should learn from the Monet plan that you should plan for the mission that you're trying to to solve. So don't plan the whole economy. Focus at the key sectors, find a, a transition pathway for them, and then get the right people in the right structures to talk to each other to generate the plan, and of course to iterate the plan. You know, decarbonization will take decades. And whatever we plan today is not going to happen in that way. We will have to change the plans. We'll have to update the plans. And having the right structures and the right people talking to each other will facilitate this process of first drawing up a plan and then revising it and revising it and revising it. To do it. Um, according to my watch, I have about five minutes left before we go into the Q&A. So I will talk about what I think is actually the greatest difficulty with planning. And, and I don't think it's the technical question. I think smart people like, like you and like other people who work on the, on the problem, if you give them enough time and if we look at the historical examples and talk to policymakers, I think technically we can do the planning. I think the real difficulty, and again, this comes from, from my historical research, the real difficulty seems to be political. Um, and if, if I think of the cases that strike me as really successful examples of planning at this economy-wide a level, you know, not the whole economy, but within the economy, driving major changes. All the successful cases have massive political support for this act of transformation, the planned act of transformation. And a very interesting one is, is this um, American conversion from peacetime economy to wartime economy. And this book, highly recommended, um, is, is a history of the government business relations in this moment of transitioning the economy. And what's interesting is in the beginning, both government and business say, well, let's coordinate this transformation through the market. So dear government, if you want to you know, have 50,000 tanks so that you can go to Europe and fight Germany, just go on the market and buy 50,000 tanks. And so in the beginning, the American government literally does procurement and says, well, you know, we would like dear Ford Motor Company or dear General Motors, we know you can build cars, so you can also build tanks. Can you please build us 40,000 tanks? And it doesn't really work because the, the companies are afraid to take the risks to convert their factories and make these investments to scale up. And so um, eventually they build a political consensus where everyone agrees, both business and government, they have a political consensus to say, look, the riskiness of transitioning to a wartime economy, the business risk is too high for the private sector. 
we can only do it if you, the government, take the risk onto your balance sheet, if you draw up some plans, if you give us direction, if you, if you create the framework. And it was once you had this political consensus that they could change the approach, they could change from a market approach to a business, uh, to, a, to, a, to a planned approach, and then things happened very quickly. But first you needed the politics and then the, 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 the planning could happen. Um, and then this is a, a screenshot from, from a book um, uh, about French planning. And it's written by, by one of the, the kind of great um, practitioners of, of um, French planning. And in his characterization, he says the, the, the um, true soul of French planning was the spirit of planning, not the particular plan, and not even those, those uh, modernization commissions I showed earlier. It was the, the spirit of the plan. And what was the spirit of the plan? It was the, the concert, the coming together, the kind of collaboration of all the social and economic forces of the nation. And so you need this deeper um, consent, this deeper consensus around planning, which is political consensus, to then be able to do the technical planning um, later on. Um, and I think we see precisely this, this constraint, this problem today, because if you look around, an awful lot of planning, especially in the sustainability space, is already happening. So in, in Germany, um, we have planning for transport. There's a thing called the Bundesverkehrswegeplan, where the federal government has a plan for roughly which roads and which railroads and which uh, river connections should be uh, invested in, scaled up, or maybe maybe scaled down, or which new connections should be built. So there's a kind of a, a comprehensive transport plan for Germany, though not for aviation. It's, it's only ground transport. There's a plan, a long-range plan for the electricity grid. There's a, there's a national strategy around hydrogen. So we, we in Germany, we're already doing a lot of this planning, thinking, this kind of structured approach. But because the political will behind it is not strong enough yet, the ambition within those plans is not there, there, um, there yet. So even though it happens, it, it doesn't happen fast enough. It doesn't happen uh, ambitiously enough. Um, and now you might ask yourself, why is that? And this is this is where where I'll come to the end of my talk. Um, I think we can we can say one thing, um, looking back at the last decade, and that's that far-sighted centrists like let's say President Obama or Chancellor Merkel, who I think had you know the best of intentions who took climate change extremely seriously, um, they held maybe politically that they couldn't move fast enough and far enough. And they probably experienced a limit by existing power balances. Um, and this made me think of a quote by the American president, um, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt from the New Deal, where he was approached by advocates for, I can't remember some, some issue, um, uh, I can't remember the particular issue. And he said, look, 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 you've convinced me. Um, I, as the president, believe that it's the right thing to do. But that's not enough. You know, I, as the president, I'm embedded in these power struggles and, and I have opponents in my party, in parliament, and I need, to, I need to convince them. And so in a way, you have to make me do it by convincing the other people, by putting the president in a position where he has no other choice, where it's for him politically rational to do it. Um, and that's something that I think didn't happen uh, over the last decade. That's my timer. So um, I, will, I will wrap it up quickly now. Um, one political framework that I think is both promising but has its risk is this Green New Deal framework where you think, well, you can build uh, the political consensus by adding the question of class politics, of redistribution to the politics of decarbonization. Um, but that's a double-edged sword, pretty obviously, because if you, if you link uh, redistribution to climate politics, you're going to win support from the poor, but you might lose support from the rich who ultimately will have to pay for the redistribution. And you have to ask yourself who is more powerful today, and I would just leave that open to discussion. Um, one thing that looks promising in the US is this recent uh, large piece of legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, which linked climate with, with planning and with subsidies and with good jobs and protectionism. That's just a screenshot of the, the, the bill, and it built the coalition um, that was needed to pass it, which was, of course, very painful, as all of you know. Um, through basically giving subsidies to industry, jobs for workers, and taking out all the stuff that Joe Manchin personally didn't like. Um, interesting planning behind it, but I'm not going to go into that now. Um, and implicitly, the assumption that you know you can grow your way out of climate change if degrowth is necessary, then we have a whole different conversation. But again, I'm going to skip that because of time. Um, what I find interesting is that this model of 
taking subsidies and jobs. And so you build an industry and worker coalition. That's difficult in Europe because obviously we have the, the Eurozone fiscal rules, which limit the fiscal space for, for, um, for subsidies um, more so than in the US. And it's not a question of existing debt levels. We could do it in Europe. We have the, the space. It's just a question of the rules that we've given ourselves. That's something my think tank works on a lot. And we try to kind of create space within, within those rules. And then the other question is trade. You know, a big part of the American package, Inflation Reduction Act, was basically protectionist saying you only get the subsidies if you produce in the US. Um, and that's something that is harder to do for Europe because the US, as again, I'm sure most of you know, is much less trade dependent. So if they do subsidies and protectionism at home and there's retaliation from Europe, the Americans can always say, bah, it's okay, it's not that important for us. We do a lot more trade. So if we do this kind of subsidies, protectionism package at home, and then our trade partners retaliate, it's a much bigger problem for us. So um, we're more afraid to use protectionism, which you might need to build a political alliance because we're afraid of the backlash. And so you have these two challenges, fiscal and, and, and trade, um, and that makes it harder to build cross-class coalition. Um, I still think there's a way forward, and I think that's that's kind of bottom-up initiatives, and that, that's kind of basically pushing wherever any of us can push, and that builds momentum, and, and um, that's, I think, the, the way to do it. Wrapping up, three points. Planning is essential because um, market coordination is stuck in this dilemma. If you really push with carbon pricing, you might break the mechanism. If you want to preserve the mechanism, you can only do small-scale pricing. It's not going to be fast enough. Planning is technically possible. We have these examples that we can learn from get the right people to talk to each other, plan the mission, not the whole economy. And planning is difficult because of the politics. Um, it requires this deep political consensus um, and building that support is hard, but I think building momentum through lots of small successes is promising. And I will leave it here and thank you very much. And I look forward to, to the questions and to the discussion.